Come along with us to see some of the most monumental treasures in the world. High in the Peruvian Andes, there is a place of sun worship and mysterious ritual, Machu Picchu. Even today, the lost city of the Incas is like an amazing castle, with steep ravines on three sides, and on the fourth, a protective mountain range. The warm light of the first rays of sunshine penetrate through the evening mist and, as with each morning, the mysterious, weather-beaten, ruined city rises once again. Like an eagle's nest, its archaic buildings lie between vertical rock walls. Through entrances of sculpted stone blocks, guard houses appear. Walls and embankments seem to defend the inner ruins, with its temples and places of cultural interest from unwelcome guests. Only this wild jungle vegetation could have protected the city from total destruction by the Spanish. From seamless stone blocks, it seems that even today, 500 years after being built, its flourishing life of yesteryear wants to reveal itself yet again. Sacrificial altars and ritual stone banks testify to the sun cult of the Inca city. In full view of this majestic mountainous world, it was here that the so-called sun virgins carried out holy rituals and dances, and where human sacrifices were brought to silence the gods. The mist-clad mountain summits looked down on the mysterious city, discovered in 1911. Machu Picchu may have been devoted to a religious cult. It is thought that in the mid-15th century, at the zenith of Inca wealth, around a thousand people lived here. Planting and harvesting depended on the moon cycle, to which the moon goddess Mama Kilia paid homage. The rain god and earth goddess also played an important role in the hierarchy of the gods. As no one could think of another name for this lost city, it was named after the mountain located next to it, Machu Picchu, or Ancient Mountain Peak. In order to survive the harsh climate, the Inca farmers overcame nature's hostility by building artistically terraced slopes on which to grow their food. In Inca's times, the hardy llama was used as both a pet and a farm animal. 
To the present, these llamas manage to find nourishing blades of grass from the scant earth. It has not been possible to discover the secret of the Inca's building techniques. The huge stone blocks fit together seamlessly. Due to the huge quantity of building materials used and amazing construction techniques, it's not surprising that the creation of this city has always been associated with extraterrestrial influences. It's also unclear why, in this part of the world, certain plants thrive, the origin and classification of which no botanist has been able to determine. The trapeze-shaped opening of the three-windowed temple is also a mystery for archaeologists. This kind of window opening is unique to Machu Picchu. The temple stands on a massive rock foundation and displays a row of unusual stonemasonry. Terrace-styled hills of the city plateaus are linked via stone steps and complete gardens and palaces are to this day still supplied with water by canals, fountains and mains pipes. Splashing, bubbling water from underground springs flows as tiny waterfalls into stone basins. The climb up gentle steps helps overcome the height difference between each dwelling and in this way makes good use of the hostile terrain. The roots of exotic plants and trees harmoniously appear through the walls and steps of these steep slopes. Mosaic type boulders prevent them from slippage. To this day, there's no explanation why these architectural masterpieces were suddenly abandoned by their inhabitants. Even now, this holy place can be accessed only by the rocky, mountainous paths built by its former inhabitants. Should these temple grounds be hidden from the eyes of mere mortals? The mysterious world of Machu Picchu will no doubt remain one of the unsolved mysteries of this planet. Torre de Belém is one of the main landmarks of the Portuguese metropolis of Lisbon. Equally, it's a reminder of the importance of Portugal as a military and naval power in past centuries.
hundreds of sea voyages to India and Africa embarked from here, the mouth of the river Tejo, spreading word of Portugal's newfound glory around the world. The influences of many countries are to be found in the construction of this fortification. Byzantine, Venetian and also Arabian, even Indian building elements combine in the Torre de Bellum in monumental manualism style. Widely visible and in the form of a ship rising out of the sea, this fascinating construction symbolizes the spirit of discovery of its creator, King Manuel I. The tower was originally built on a river island, but various natural and human alterations to the riverbed have now caused it to be exposed on dry land. The vast cellars of the underground terraces were originally used as a means of defence. Massive stone blocks hermetically sealed the interior from the outside world. In order to protect the approaches to Lisbon, through embrasures facing the open sea, cannons pointed threateningly towards any advancing foe. Barred openings are also reminders of the times when political prisoners languished in chains here. At high tide, these dungeons were frequent witness to a gruesome death by drowning. A narrow stone step leads from the terrace of this much-prized six-cornered pewter fortress like the bow of a ship towering up from the sea. This monument was built to commemorate the 500th day of the death of Henry the Sailor and is also a reminder of Portugal's naval power. As sole ruler and one who personally never actually set foot on board ship, he arranged numerous adventurous voyages to South Africa. The buildings are reminiscent of Mohammedan turbans which crown the roof of the four-story tower. There was once another similar tower on the other side of the river. Crossfire from both sides meant that the harbour entrance was well protected. Grotesque figures decorate the external walls and heavy towing machinery indicates the power required to operate the drawbridge. The symbolic, goddess-like statue of the Madonna, the Lady of Success, on the terrace of the fortress, is dedicated to Portugal's sailors of discovery. A typical Venetian element is portrayed by the pillar-decorated balconies. 
The cross of the Christ Knights Order and the Portuguese royal emblem emphasize the significance of this building. Since its renovation, the roof with its pyramid-shaped pewter-decorated chapel stands out prominently over Lisbon's harbour. Here the discoverer Vasco da Gama yearned for distant lands and was inspired for his major voyage to India. The tower was put to good use. The armory was on the second floor. The third floor contained a royal reception room. And the fourth was both a kitchen and dining room. The Sala Rigier, the audience hall of the monarch, enchants by way of its simple yet tasteful furnishings. A symbol of royal power, the floor and ceiling layout and the figurative and ornamental decor of all elements of Manuelist authority are clearly demonstrated. As the light of European culture, Manuel I required that everyone should fully understand the significance of this building. Artistic influences from each corner of the world blend together in a charming ensemble. It is fortunate that this regal building was not destroyed by the great earthquake of 1755. Torre de Belém is a monument built in a country that provided it with the means to be the starting point for many important voyages of discovery. And especially a road to the new world discovered for the rest of Europe. The famous discoverer Marco Polo called the Chinese city of Suzhou the Venice of the East. But unlike in Italy, countless bicycles are part of daily life in this modern city. However, Suzhou is more well known for its gardens. bridges span across its canals, while run-down houses indicate the meagre financial resources of their inhabitants. The city's more impressive and elegant buildings date back to Suzhou's long and glorious past such as the town gate and wall of Pan Men. The town was founded in 514 BC when Prince He Lui of Wu made this place, that is around 80 kilometers west of the present metropolis of Shanghai, into his capital city.
Above a wide 24 kilometer long wall, a path leads to numerous interesting locations and also picturesque views across the water. As prosperous mandarins became attracted to the city and settled here, various elegant residences gradually appeared. The Garden of Politics for the Simple Man is one of the four most popular gardens in China and it attracts a large number of visitors. These grounds were designed according to the wishes of an important Mandarin between 1522 and 1566. They are divided into three large areas. There is a guest's residence, a large central garden and also another smaller garden. These paintings by the Ming artist Wen Zheng Ming served as the model for the creation of this artificial yet harmonious paradise. the master of the nets is somewhat smaller. Nevertheless, it is considered to be a gem of Chinese garden design. The origin of this garden dates back to the 12th century. Requiring a suitable residence for his retirement, it was then that the vice minister for defense settled here. Decorated with the finest timber, the residence interior was created later because the garden was in a poor state of repair. Over the years, the garden became increasingly overgrown and fell into decay until it was fully restored in the 18th century. It was subsequently taken over by the aristocracy. The garden of the master of the nets, known in Chinese as Wang Shi Yuan, is a unique combination of both building design and vibrant garden art. The resounding name of this garden residence stemmed from its original name, the Hermit Fisherman's Egg. Scholars, top civil servants and artists gradually transformed this area into the work of art that we see today. Although the garden covers an area of only 5,000 square meters, its ingenious architecture gives an amazing impression of open space.
As with the garden of politics for the simple man, the garden of rest is also one of the country's most beautiful gardens. Abbot Zhu Taishi founded this garden in the 16th century. At that time, he planned to divide the area into both an eastern and a western section. bizarre and strangely formed stones were introduced into the eastern part of the garden, known as Dong Yuan. The garden gradually changed ownership until an important minister of the Manchu regime acquired it in 1876. Its official owner, Sheng Zuren, completely redesigned the grounds. This led to the division of the 20 hectare garden into four areas and the creation of several new buildings. With its perfect beauty, Suzhou is evocative of an even more famous garden, the Garden of Eden. The Chinese garden is full of complex history and art that manifests itself as a sanctuary of simple harmony and peace. In southern Spain, majestically yet mysteriously, the legendary Alhambra proudly rises above Granada's atmospheric old town. Curiously, the history of the Alhambra began with the gradual decline of the Islamic Empire of the Moorish Al-Andalus. After Cordoba, the former center of power of the caliphs fell into the hands of the Christians in 1238 and Granada became the country's new capital city. Muhammad I ordered the construction of the Alhambra's massive walls and 24 watchtowers above the remains of a comparatively modest fortress. One of the most important Moorish buildings, and also one of Spain's most famous attractions, was built on the city's Sabica Hill. In addition to splendid Islamic architecture, in the Christian Alhambra, Renaissance design is clearly visible. The impressive palace of Charles V stands out from the architecture of the surrounding buildings of the Nasridis. It is of great symbolic character. Some of its bas-reliefs contain a number of amorous fertility rites. These would have been strictly forbidden in Moorish art.
Charles V deliberately built his palace here as this location had once been the last bastion of Muslim power in Spain. The palace thus symbolized the triumph of the Christian world. In spite of its imposing appearance, construction of the Renaissance palace remained incomplete. In 1568, a revolt brought its construction to an end. In addition to the external splendor of the Christian palace, the full beauty of its Moorish architecture is only fully revealed by exploring the Alhambra's glorious interior. It is believed that the Mechwa Hall was built at the command of Ishmael I and served as a meeting place for the government of the day. Numerous new building programs and several architectural embellishments to the Alhambra palaces continued right up until the 15th century. The former splendor of the Comaris Palace, built by Muhammad V around 1370, after the successful conquest of Algeciras, is still evident today. The interaction of space, light and color is magical and also gives a splendid impression of the remarkable artistry and creative skills of the Moors. The picturesque Myrtle Courtyard was at the center of the Islamic residential quarters with the private rooms of the royal family situated around it. The reflection of the surrounding buildings on the surface of the water was designed to enhance still further the beautiful architecture. Under the rule of Muhammad V between 1362 and 1391, the Nasridis kingdom was at its zenith the famous Lion Fountain also originated at that time. Although nothing remains of its original gilding, the fountain and its marble lions still radiate elegance and dignity. Close by, the King's Hall fascinates visitors with its stucco-like decorative elements, or mukanas, that are among the most beautiful in the Alhambra. But following the conquest of Granada by the Catholic kings, the cultural and architectural treasures of the Moors were soon forgotten. However, thanks to the American writer Washington Irving, the Alhambra and the neighboring Generalifa once again became a focus of attention in the 19th century. The grounds of the Generalifa Palace were originally designed as an agricultural area. Instead, a wonderful garden gradually evolved. These beautifully laid out gardens must once have been a veritable paradise on earth and a dream come true.
The water courtyard was at the center of the Ganar Alifa Palace, a symbol of the Moorish admiration for this vital commodity. The exquisite beauty of these gardens has inspired numerous Oriental and Western writers and poets. Thus the despair of the last Nasridas ruler strikes a poignant chord today. According to legend, when he was forced to abandon his palace to the Christian armies without a fight, his eyes filled with tears as he glanced back at his beloved Alhambra. Set in the picturesque, deeply fissured hillside of the Parnas is Delphi, legendary ancient Greek home to the Holy Oracle. Delphi is the place where more than 2,000 years ago, the Greeks sought spiritual advice from the god Apollo whom they believed spoke to them by way of an oracle. This idyllic location, which includes the holy temple of Athena Pronaia, has retained its mystique right up until the present day. The first archaeological excavations began here in 1832. They dug at an altitude of between five and six hundred meters and uncovered the remains of this once flourishing religious center. A female priest by the name of Pitya allowed herself to be inspired by intoxicating fumes which emanated from a crack in the earth and then transmitted Apollo's divine instructions. Because of its special geographical location, in ancient times Delphi was known as the navel of the world. From the hillsides of the temple area, a breathtaking view opens up over the valley of the river Plistus. Today, this ionic marble capital is located at the junction of Holy Street and Temple Street. The well-known and much-worshipped oracle attracted so many people that during the 7th century BC, Delphi became the cultural and religious center of ancient Greece. One of many inscriptions describes the famous Battle of Marathon, while other text glorifies the Pythic Games that were held here every four years. Several monuments were located along the northern side of the square in front of the temple. Originally, an equestrian statue of King Prusias was situated on this pillar.
Before entering the holy place of Delphi, the pilgrims of Apollo ritually washed themselves in the Castalian Spring. This magnificent amphitheater was built in the 4th century BC. It is one of the most well-preserved amphitheaters in Greece and can hold up to 5,000 spectators. This idyllic terrain contains the ruins of a total of 20 former treasure houses. Precious gifts to the oracle were stored here. The Delphi Museum contains a fascinating collection of archaeological finds and valuable works of art. This bronze statue of the charioteer of Delphi that was excavated in 1896 is world famous. Unfortunately, very little of the chariot has survived. The two larger than life-sized heroes made from paric marble are considered to be archaic. During the course of more than 2,000 years, the ancient site of Delphi has not lost any of its former fascination. It is still a magical place. Sukhothai, Dawn of Happiness. This, the name of the first capital of Thailand, marked the beginning of a new epoch. During the course of its 120-year flowering period, several of the city's impressive buildings were created, such as the magnificent Wat Mahathat Temple. Two huge nine-meter-high statues of the Standing Buddha flank the central building of the largest and most important Sukhothai temple. Unlike the nearby palace that was constructed of wood, much of the large royal Wat Mahathat temple has survived to the present day A long line of worshippers that contains a total of 40 figures on each side decorates the lower section of a tall pedestal within the central area of the sanctuary. Within a total area of around 40,000 square meters, almost 200 chedis were once located here between the 13th and 14th centuries. Even today, the Wat Mahathat Temple is a symbol of the heyday of the legendary capital of Sukhothai in its former grandeur. Thailand grew in size during this period and the introduction of Tevada Buddhism brought dramatic cultural change. The zenith of Sukhothai was a calm and peaceful period in Thailand's colourful history.
750 years after its construction, those who come here can still enjoy the harmonious atmosphere of this fascinating temple. Some areas of the sanctuary still show signs of Khmer architecture. They mark the period of transition of the new capital. The origins of Thailand's first kingdom began in 1238, shortly after the Khmer had been successfully pushed back into Cambodia. But it was to be almost a century later that the city reached its cultural zenith. Under King Ramkang the Great, an alphabet was introduced that was derived from the Mon language and had been developed by the king himself. The sanctuary in the southwest of Wat Shri Sawai dates back to the founding of Sukhothai and was probably a strictly Hindu temple. Towards the end of the 13th century, King Ram Kang Hang had the sacred structure of the Khmer that was believed to have been dedicated to the god Shiva transformed according to the architectural demands of Tivada Buddhism. Beyond the old city walls is the fascinating Wat Si Chum Temple. This temple owes its national fame to the huge seated Buddha sculpture of Pra Achana. More than 11 meters high, it's one of the largest and most imposing Buddha statues in Thailand. believed that the origin of the mighty Buddha of Wat Si Chum dates back to the second half of the 14th century. The subsequent decline and fall of Sukhothai may already have occurred by that time. well-preserved Chedi of Singhalese design is the main landmark of Wat Shra Shri. Another sanctuary well worth a visit and situated north of the royal temple. In addition to several smaller Chedis, there are also the ruins of a large meeting hall on a small temple island. An attractive seated Buddha statue and a total of six rows of columns are all that remain of the Vihan. A bronze statue is dedicated to the founder of the glamorous Sukhothai period, King Ram Kamhang, close to the entrance area. This legendary ruler was a highly skilled diplomat and trader who nurtured close connections with China in order to expand his country's ceramics industry. Only a few sections of a large moat remain of the former king's residence. Yet the original dimensions of the palace are still quite easy to discern. The remains of the Tapa Dang Shrine are one of the city's oldest sacred buildings. In 
In 1376, Sukhothai was forced to acknowledge the sovereignty of another Thai metropolis. Power now lay in the hands of Ayutthaya. Picturesque, yet almost sad, the century-old ruins seem to be reflected within the water of the nearby moats, canals and ponds. Yearning for a bygone time, when the area was full of buildings that in turn were full of life. This world contains numerous monumental treasures. Although many have already been revealed, how many more remain to be discovered? Today, it is the responsibility of UNESCO to protect these magnificent monuments.